the WB you know, may for an established documentarian not issue a no or issue a no action letter, but they're not going to do it for us. And uh, the bottom line here is that remix, like textual quotation, when the subject of discussion is words, it's an important source of cultural, artistic, and political criticism and commentary. Remix are exactly the kinds of socially beneficial uses that fair use is designed to promote. They're transformative in meaning and message. They copy only small parts of the original. They often say things that copyright owners don't want to have said. And they're made not in order to achieve commercial success, but to express something about the world. And I want to end on a more theoretical note. It's unwise, as a matter of respect for authors, to say, it's true that these are transformed works, and it's true that you made them to communicate a message rather than for profit. But you nevertheless don't deserve an exemption, because people outside your artistic community believe that you should have made a less beautiful work, and that that less beautiful work would have worked OK. A core reason copyright has a non-discrimination principle is that it's not a great idea for lawyers to judge the merits of art. The Vidding community, as the comments in our submission show, highly values quality footage, which among other things allows for more advanced editing techniques that contribute to the meaning of his. And those artistic judgments are worthy of respect, even if not everyone has the same reaction. We don't tell oil painters that they could get OK results with watercolors. We don't tell sculptors that they could achieve many of the same results with a trowel instead of with a knife. In part, we don't do this because most lawyers aren't particularly expert painters or sculptors, and it's easy to make a mistake about the technical possibilities of the medium um, compared to someone who actually practices it. But we also don't do that because it's not the law's proper role. Perhaps an art critic could say, that would have looked fine at a lower frame rate with, and with more pixelization. But the copyright office shouldn't, once it makes the initial determination that non-commercial remix includes a substantial number of non-infringing uses, which is the standard. Everyone agrees that screen capture, when it works, makes a copy that could suffice for <coughs> casual entertainment purposes. This makes the question of what harm the exemption might do basically irrelevant. Anyone who wants to make a full copy of a work for pure consumption purposes can conceivably do so if they invest in three or four programs. The only question is how an exemption would affect people who are making clips for other purposes. So with an exemption in place, we focus our educational efforts and our assistance to fan artists, as we've been doing, uh, on the crucial question of fair use. And there are numerous transformative non-commercial remix videos put online every day. Uh, we talked about a, a video that commented on a widely publicized story on Glee about a gay experiences. None of these exemptions have been shown to cause any harm uh, and or anyone who's misunderstood it to suggest that you can distribute entire work. Right? The line between editing remix and, and creating a new work and copying the entire work is really pretty clear. And that's a message that we can take back. So that's what uh, I suggest you should continue to do. Thank you. Thank you. Francesca? Hi. Uh, I'm Francesca Copa. I'm a professor of English, and I'm uh, the founding director of film studies at Willowbrook College. Uh, I'm also one of the founders of the OGW, the Organization for Transformative Works. Um, and I'm here to give a, a bit of a cultural and uh, social picture of remix video and remix bidders, uh, particularly the 35-year um, practice on the span bidding, which was the subject of much of our um, bidding, the making of music video by setting mass media images to music, predates the digital. In fact, it predates YouTube, the DMCA, and the internet itself. In the 70s, fans made bids using stills. In the 80s, they used footage that they taped off TV before commercial TV was sold, and they used commercial VHS tapes, and then they started using DVDs uh, in the aughts. Bidding is an art with a long history. Vids are shown live at conventions and often reviewed afterwards in critical panels. Um, as well as distributed on the web. Bidders congregate and trade aesthetic and technical tips on mailing lists and in other community hubs. Bidders themselves make documentaries celebrating their art and the work of other bidders. Um, some bidders release DVD commentaries discussing the choices that they made in their own uh, vids. So this is an advanced art form um, with its own sophisticated, albeit amateur, non-professional, non-commercial uh, community. Um, but bids and other forms of remix video have also received mainstream and are starting to receive more mainstream critical attention in museum exhibitions, uh, like the currently running Spectacle to Music Video, which is on uh, in Cincinnati and is coming to the Museum of the Moving Image, uh, on NPR, in mainstream magazines like New York Magazine, and in film studies journals like Cinema Journal and Camera Obscura. To make a music video out of mass media footage, out of TV and movies, is to transform it, to distill a two-hour movie or multi-season TV show into three or four minutes of video, is to radically change the story and the emphasis of the image. To edit footage to emphasize its musicality, rather than to re-narrate or rehash a plot, is to make something very different of it. Uh, in my more recent scholarly work, I've been talking about the way in which 
uh, music video and remix video demonstrates poetic qualities like lyricism, tone, emotion, uh, and density of symbolism and imagery rather than kind of traditional mass media film qualities. Um, I say this to emphasize that I believe that the making of music video is a creative and transformative act even before we get to the content, to turn five seasons of The Wire or seven seasons of Buffy or 16 hours of Harry Potter into a three minute music video is a significant transformation of form before you even get to content and the message uh, of the piece. Um, but the content of, of remix video and vidding is transformative as well, and vids tell stories and make arguments that articulate the perspective of vidders who are primarily women and racial and sexual minorities. Um, this makes sense, vidding is a lot of work, um, and you need an incentive to talk back and rewrite uh, culture. It is overwhelmingly uh, women and sexual and racial minorities um, that I'm here representing and that you vid who feel the need to, uh, to change the focus and the form of mass culture to make better sense within their reality and to appeal um, more closely to their tastes. Um, the changes that vidders make range from the more overt kinds of critical readings, uh, making queer, feminist, other kinds of politically charged readings of the kinds that we discussed uh, in our comment, um, to the more implicit criticism of changing the filmic perspective or the narrative emphasis, saying this is the important character, this background moment was a key moment, right? Saying as artists always do, I'm gonna make you see this material through my eyes, the way I see it. Um, to fit is to therefore be part of a conversation with others who are interested both in making art and in being part of a vibrant critical community that discusses culture. This is a grassroots art world. The existing exemption has been extremely helpful to artists of the Vidic community, as well as to me in my work as former OTW communications chair. The existing exemption for non-commercial remixers is easy to explain, and it fits easily, um, as Rebecca said, within fandom's own internal ethical codes. Fans believe in paying creators, uh, and the general feeling is that if you buy the DVDs, you should be able to criticize them and make something new out of them. Um, this uh, the line that people understand is not particularly between DMCA compliant and non-DMCA compliant technology, but between paying for your source, whether it's DVDs or Amazon Unbox, and not paying for your source footage. Um, for remixers, mainstream culture is then not just a product to be consumed, but an invitation to create more art and to participate in a cultural discussion. Um, what these exemptions mean in practice for us is that we've been able to say to people, look, if you think your vid is a transformative fair use, you should feel free to fight a takedown or a cease and desist notice. That assurance is particularly important in the non-commercial remix community because bidders tend to come from demographics that don't necessarily assume that their voices are wanted or even legitimate. Um, as Gordon said earlier, for documentary filmmakers, uh, similarly as with documentary filmmakers, non-commercial remixers felt that they could not stand up and say, my vid is a fair use, my vid is legitimate, it should be restored on YouTube, um, because they were worried that they had broken some law in the making of the thing that they thought was fair. Um, and with that out of the way, we have seen a huge rise in people being able to challenge um, mainstream, increasingly commercially owned broadcast systems and distribution systems to say, no, look, please restore my, uh, my video. Uh, my work is important. So, you know, to, it's important to understand that videos come from this culture of fear, uh, a culture in which it's assumed their speech is not uh, valuable, and this is part of what it means to speak from the margins uh, when it comes to mass media culture. Um, these vulnerable speakers, and, and in fact, I should say that, you know, in my own work, I often speak uh, about the vidders who are the most sophisticated high artists, the people whose work uh, as remixers in, is contiguous with feminist remixers, with appropriation artists like Cindy Sherman, with um, uh, experimental collage filmmakers of the 60s. Um, but a lot of vidders are young people. They're 15, 16, 17 year old girls, and they don't necessarily have the same sense of entitlement that you might see in more male dominated uh, subcultures. They don't assume that their voices are wanted or defensible. Uh, and older bidders, who are the 20, 30, 40, 60, 60 year old bidders, uh, many of them, uh, pink collar workers who do make the kinds of works that end up in museum exhibitions, uh, by and large, are differently vulnerable. They're not willing to risk a lawsuit. They're not gonna jeopardize their own finances or their family's uh, finances. And so it's easier to, to go away if you get uh, a takedown and not uh, fight it. So it's been very, very important to say to these artists, if your work is fair, if it's transformative, you should take a chance to defend it because 95% of the time you're not the victim uh, of, a, uh, of a person, it's an algorithm, right? They're not judging your work, they haven't seen your work. Uh, and as, as Rebecca said, when we do tell people this uh, and a person looks at it, we have never had anybody come back and say that this work does not look fair. Uh, and we at the OTW have done fairly well at getting that message out, uh, which has been a positive good of this exemption uh, in terms of encouraging diverse kinds of speech. Uh, and I, as others have said, have heard nothing to suggest that there's been any harm or downside uh, or problem uh, with the exemption whatsoever. Um, lastly, uh, in film and media studies, we've been talking, teachers were saying this morning, we talk more and more about multimedia literacy, teaching students how to read and write in a variety of media, 
Uh, and fan artists and remixers like Bitters are currently being studied in art schools, in media departments, in film uh, studies departments, because they've been having multimedia conversations longer than the rest of us. They're becoming the model right, that teachers are using. Uh, in a recent book published Digital Fandom, he suggests that media studies reinvent itself along the lines and using the practices that non-commercial remixers uh, have developed over these last 30 years. So we're in a place where, in fact, the mainstream is starting to kind of copy the artistic uh, and, and discursive innovations of the minority community, right? So it's really important uh, to leave a window that you don't have to be a certain kind of authorized uh, speaker to speak and to, to, to allow these kinds of grassroots artistic practices uh, by some of the people whose voices are most uh, fragile uh, uh, to continue and not to sort of set up a situation where you have two classes of speakers, a kind of a high speech uh, and a low speech where professionals get to speak in a particularly glossy kind of language and non-commercial uh, workers have to speak in a kind of degraded vernacular. So thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to have a, uh, visual examples in a minute, so my lovely assistant Francesca is going to get that set up, uh, but I'm going to go ahead and start. Um, I'm an associate professor of English at the University of Minnesota at Morris, and my research focuses on the rhetoric of remix video, but I'm also a bidder myself, and that's the perspective from which I'm going to be speaking today. Um, professor Teshnet and Professor Kuppa have spoken about the legal and the cultural aspects of remix video. I'm going to talk more about the aesthetic and the technical concerns. I am no Jim Morissette. I'm an English major. I do not have an engineering background, but I'm going to try to walk you through a little bit of the, the technical stuff that goes into vidding. Um, so there are two main points that I want to make. Uh, the first is that vidders need high quality source for both rhetorical and aesthetic reasons. Uh, the second is that the screen capture solution posed at the Tech Day hearings doesn't work. Um, so let me start by saying that 15 to 20 years ago, we were all accustomed to fuzzy images, right? Um, we watched VHS tapes of, I don't know, LA Law and Twin Peaks um, recorded on super long play, maybe recorded over two or three times if your you know, family was cheap and didn't want to buy lots of new tapes. Um, and even now, we're still used to seeing fuzzy images in certain contexts, right? We've all seen streaming video on YouTube that's kind of blurry or grainy, right? Cat videos dancing babies, that kind of thing. Um, those kinds of videos are essentially home movies, and most of us are still pretty forgiving about mediocre quality in home movies. But when it comes to commercial media, our standards have changed. People are starting to lose their tolerance for fuzzy versions. Once they've seen TV shows and movies on DVD or Blu-ray on 46-inch or 55-inch high-def TV, or for that matter, a good 23-inch computer monitor. Um, even streaming services like Netflix has, have improved dramatically in quality in the last few years. And what this means is that when people see bad versions of good source, they hit the back button on their browser, right? Why should they spend any time watching that? So if I want to comment on or critique or even celebrate Lost or Mad Men or True Blood or whatever, I need high quality source. I need it in order to communicate to my audience and I need it in order to make something that meets my own artistic standards. So with that in mind, I want to talk a little bit about why some of the procedures suggested by the opponents of Class 7 won't work. Um, I would love to be able to talk about their suggestion that I use my smartphone to record DVDs, but I can't because I don't have a smartphone to test it with. Um, I was actually kind of disappointed when I heard that smartphones were pretty ubiquitous and I ran and looked in my bag, but alas, my cell phone had not magically transformed into a smartphone, so I couldn't, I couldn't do that. Um, so let's talk about screen capture software. When I watched Tim Short's demo at the Tech Day hearings, um, I was really impressed by how easy it made the screen capture process look. Um, and I should back up here for a moment to explain, for those of you who haven't done it, that preparing ripped DVD footage for editing is a pretty complicated process. Um, when I rip a DVD, I get a .vob file which my editing software can't handle directly, and in fact, most editing software can't handle directly. So I have to feed the VOB file through an indexing program that makes my editing software think it's working with an API file. Um, then I have to deinterlace the file. Do you all, do you know what deinterlacing is? Okay, um, I don't have time to explain that, but ask me if you have questions. Um, <laughs> uh, the short version is that motion pictures are interlaced or telecined 
for showing on a TV, and they have to be deinterlaced or inverse telecined somehow before they can be edited or you get a disaster. That's the short version. Um, there are several ways you can do this. I do it by writing a little piece of code called a script. This is a little bit of, of a stretch for an English major, but I learned how to do it. Um, these days, DVDs are usually encoded anamorphically. Do you know what that means? Again, ask me later. Um, the short version is that the image comes out stretched vertically, right? Everyone's really skinny. Um, and so the image has to be resized. It either has to be stretched horizontally or it has to be squished vertically so that it'll look right. Um, or else everyone looks really anorexic. Um, so in order to get the correct aspect ratio, you have to do something to the file. Then the file has to be clipped somehow because you can't just throw a two-hour movie or an hour-long episode of TV into the editing timeline. I mean, I guess you could, but you would get the blue screen of death really, really fast. So um, practically speaking, you can't do it. Um, and I have to do all of this really boring and complicated prep work for every single disc that I want to use, even if I'm only using three seconds from it. Um, so when I saw the screen capture demo, I thought, that could save me a ton of work. Um, then I actually tried it. Um, and the problem is that the process is easy, but the results are terrible. Uh, so when you think about it, it makes sense that the results are bad. These are programs intended to capture still images um, or low frame rate tutorial videos, right? Here is how you move your mouse. That's what they're made for. Um, and I think it's telling that the top reviewed capture programs often don't even mention DVD capture in their product descriptions. Um, but Tim Short's Tech Day demo used replay video capture, which I had not heard of, but which does bill itself as being able to capture DVDs. Um, so that's what I used in the examples that we're going to see. Um, it's 40 bucks I will never get back, which I'm a little cranky about, but OK. Um, so Tim Short talked about the tech, and I want to talk about the results of the tech, what we actually see. Um, so we're going we're gonna to start looking at that. OK, so let me tell you what I did. I captured, using replay video capture, the first 10 minutes of the 2009 Star Trek reboot movie using replay video capture. I captured it 24 frames a second, since that's what I get when I rip a DVD. And then I ripped the same 10 minute scene and I pulled some individual frames and put them side by side so we can compare them. Um, and that's what we're looking at here. The captured footage is on top and the ripped footage is on the bottom. Could someone lower the lights a bit just so you can see this a little better? Please do. Right back there on the, those two. Right there. Okay, so let's look at this first image. When we look at these two frames, there's not actually much difference here, I, I would su submit. Um, this is from a shot that has minimal motion and relatively low <coughs> light contrast from one frame to the next. So screen capture actually does a pretty decent job with that kind of shot, okay? So if you think back to Tim Short's example from the May 11th hearings, he used a scene from the movie Gattaca that's essentially sepia-toned talking heads. Um, that scene may be great for prompting a discussion about ethics in a high school biology class, um, but visually it is about as interesting as a bowl of oatmeal. Uh, once you try to capture scenes where people and objects are moving, or where there's high contrast or bright light, you start to see problems. Okay, so this is, this is another frame. It looks like the same thing, but this is from a different point in the scene. Uh, where, we've, where we've just had some bright light. And you can see now that there's a difference between what we're seeing on the top, that's the captured footage, and what we're seeing on the bottom, that's the ripped footage. That blocky effect that you see in the top example is called pixelation. What happened is that the video data has been reduced by converting color gradations into blocks of solid color. And that's why you see, especially if you look at his face, right, you see lots of individual little squares. So 16 pixels of very slightly different colors have become a 16 pixel block of a single color, right? So if you look at the trim on the uniform, if you look at the face, um, if you look at any of the diagonal lines, they're starting to get a little weird. Um, now, here's the thing about digital copies. We often think of making digital copies as simply duplicating something. And sometimes this is true. If you copy an MP3 from your computer to your MP3 player, you get an exact copy. Or if I send all of you guys a PDF, you now have the same file right, on your computer that I had on my computer. But editing video is different. When you edit video, when you add effects to video, when you export video, when you compress video to make it smaller so you can distribute it on the web, 
you lose quality. It's more like a photocopier, right? So if you make a photocopy of a book, what you get is readable. It doesn't really look like the book anymore, but it's, you know, it's still okay. But then if you make a photocopy of that, and then if you make a photocopy of that, and you make a photocopy of that, you start to get degrade. In fact, it is a lot like what happens in analog if you make a copy of a tape, and then you copy the copy, and then you copy the copy. Because you're not just doing a pristine version of the file anymore. You have done something to the file in the interim when you're using lossy compression. Um, you think about what Jim Morissette said at the previous panel about losing frames. That's the kind of data loss that we're talking about. Okay, so here I'm going to quote directly from the Microsoft website's explanation of digital video compression, their recommendation for editing practices. They say, every time you save your file in a lossy file format, it discards more of the data, even if you're saving it in the same format. <coughs> a good rule of thumb is to move to a lossy format only as the very final step in your project, okay? So converting video means losing quality. If the original quality is good, that's a manageable loss. Um, but if the original quality is not good, then every time you do anything to that image, things get ugly, okay? So this is the same frame that we just saw, but I did an effect to it, as I might if I were making a vid, if I were going to zoom in on that frame, if I wanted to get a close-up of this character's expression. Um, so I cropped it down, and then I resized it so it would be the same size as all the other frames in the video. Um, this is what we mean when we say garbage in, garbage out. As someone who's been using powerful video editing programs for 10 years now, there is nothing I can do to fix that top image. I cannot make it look more like the bottom image. Not with technology, not by sheer force of will, it just... I've lost data. I can't get that nice image on the bottom back. Okay, it's easy to degrade source quality, but it's almost impossible to improve it. And so if I start from an image as compromised as that screen capture image, um, I can't say what I want to say, either because people won't watch because it looks like that, or because they literally won't be able to see what I am trying to do. Um, so the point I want to stress is this. In this movie, in this Star Trek movie, and by extension, most of the movies that get vitted, screen capture will get you acceptable quality, but only on a very small fraction of the frames in the movie. I had to actively look for a shot that was not aggressively pixelated, okay? I, I had 10 minutes of movie, and I found two shots. The first one that I showed you, and then another, um, a very tiny ship moving very slowly through space. Another very low contrast, low motion shot. Um, if you take a look at the test suite that the OTW has provided and that we um, linked in our original proposal, you will see that vidders do use some relatively still shots in vids. That's not unusual. Um, but we also use a lot of shots where things are moving, or shots where the camera itself is moving, or shots where there's high light contrast and bright flashes. And if I am limited to using the clips that screen capture renders well, then I can't bid, unless apparently I want to bid the most visually boring scene in Gattaca. Um, so the whole point of bidding a show, rather than writing an essay about the show, is to use the visuals. That's the value of multimedia speech. Now I'm an English professor. If I want to write an essay about it, I could do that. But if I want to use the image, then I want to use the image. Um, so Cheska is showing some, uh, some additional examples that I pulled from the first just three minutes of the movie. Um, these images are now all up at the OTW test suite if you want to look at them um, more carefully, which I would really encourage. And we also have a video. I did a side-by-side -side of um, the captured footage and the ripped footage so that you can see. It's kind of funny when characters move through the middle, you can see them, they're clear, and then suddenly they're pixelated and then they're clear again. Um, so we will not show a ton of this, but just to give you a little bit of a sense. See how the, the green flash goes from clear to, um, to blocky. You can also see here what Jim was talking about with the dropped frames. You can see that the two are out of sync. Um, the, the one on the um, the one on the left is what it's supposed to look like, and then on the right, we've got 
I don't even know what's going on over there. We're just missing some frames. Okay, so after working through this exercise and looking at the captured and the ripped footage side by side, I have to tell you, I was more confused than ever by the argument that um, screen capture should be good enough for me. If the quality of screen capture is that great, I would think that it would be a terrific technology for piracy. Um, I would argue that the quality is not great, or at least it is not good enough for my purposes. I mean, maybe as a consumer I could tolerate a screen capped version of that movie, although I can't imagine why I would. I personally would rather just buy and watch the DVD. Um, but as an artist, I can't work with the quality problems that capture creates. Uh, so I want to conclude um, by noting that high quality source does not guarantee that I'm going to communicate successfully or that I'm going to create great art. Um, anybody who has seen much art at all knows that there is a lot of professional art that is ineffective or just plain bad. Um, to say nothing of amateur art like non-commercial remix, I will admit that I myself have made some pretty bad vids. There is a reason that I am an English professor and not a professional artist. Um, but I have also made some good vids. I've made vids that I'm proud of and that my community has responded to really well. So if I fail as an artist, I want it to be because I failed, not because I was forbidden to use the tools that I need. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, and thank you for listening to me speak. I'm Martin Conant Wright, a, a writing professor at Lindsay Community College, and I spoke earlier today, so I'm not going to talk at length because a lot of what I said earlier is relevant to this discussion. I'm here to support classes 7B and 7C of that that were are put forward by the EFF. Um, the points I made earlier um, are, are that the the exemption as crafted currently um, was greatly appreciated. I, I felt it was an expansion over what was present in 2006. It's appreciated and being used in the educational community. Um, the, the EFS um, proposed class 7B is broad. I mean, it, you could read that to, that it actually could uh, encapsulate the, the um, class proposed by the attorneys group. So, if you just inserted the word non-commercial or educational videos in there, it's broader. So one of the things I mentioned earlier is that I, I hope that maybe it can be addressed in this round is there's an ambiguity in the current exemption um, in, in that it, it separates out media studies students as being eligible for the educational use piece. And then it, the three, the three, the little Roman numeral one, two, and three, they're separated by semicolons. And then it says it's also okay to use it, use this exemption if you're a documentary filmmaker, and it's also okay for a non-commercial video maker. So um, if if it was premised on that any of these one or more of these categories would make you eligible to use the exemption, that would be helpful because now I'm asked, well, what if, my, what if it's not a media studies student, but it's a student who's making a non-commercial video? Wouldn't that fall under the exemption? And in the, in the, the lengthy recommendation that was written up um, in July 2010, I think a point was made that the expansion wasn't made to include all students, and yet it, you know, the argument is that if a student who's not a media studies student is making a documentary film or a non-commercial video, that they should be able to fall under the exemption somehow. So I, I just I'm in, I'm speaking in support of the EFS proposed classes, uh, proposed classes. They're they're broad and um, they would actually work for the educational community, especially if that was discussed in the recommendation. But if there's a way that with in this next round that we could connect the bitter exemption with the educational exemption, I think that that would be really helpful. Um, obviously, some of the bidders are also college students. So if, it, if it's way more explicit, that more explicit, then um, I and other interested teachers can develop lesson plans and actually feel confident about addressing um, how to legally construct these types of um, texts in our writing classrooms. So, and that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Corinne, you did testify in Los Angeles. I think the reason we invited you back is basically because we had some opponents who weren't here before uh, in L.A. So I'm just going to pose a question of your choice. Does it make sense for you to go after they've go out, gone, or do you want to go now? Um, well, what I had planned to do is do just a couple minutes, sort of sum up, and then sort of reserve my time for okay. after they go. Go ahead. Is that okay? 
I mean, I, I was conscious of that very thing. So, um, so I promise, just just um, a couple points. Um, so, first point, um, I think with respect to this exemption, um, one of the things that we've had, we've had reams of paper, we've had hours and hours of testimony, you know what we haven't had? A single shred of evidence of harm. I think many people have pointed this out and it applies equally well to non-commercial videos as to the other exemptions. We just have no reason to think there's been harm. What we've heard in LA is, um, and what we've heard here, I think is speculation that there might be harm, that some copyright owners might feel uncomfortable making their works available, but that seems to me is entirely speculative. Um, we've heard that digital di distribution methods depend on DRM. No one's arguing that. Of course they do. Um, but this exemption doesn't prevent anyone from using DRM. It just takes away the sort of Damocles that hangs over the, the head of folks who want to break that DRM to engage in lawful, lawful purposes. We've heard here and in Los Angeles that an exemption might send a message, an unfortunate message that content is DRM free. But it seems to me that if you're worried about a message that's being sent, the right way to respond to that is more and better education about 1201, which I think is sorely needed. And I would suggest that it seems to me that the, the large content owners are in a really good position to get that message out. Uh, and we, of course, are doing our very best at EFF and at OTW to do that very thing on very limited budgets. Um, secondly, and I won't belabor this because I think it's well covered, but I hope that it's been put to bed, the, or the, the notion that screen capture is an acceptable alternative for many mixed artists. I just, I hope that um, we've, we've heard enough to be comfortable that that is simply not adequate. <coughs> um, and just, I, I just want to stress that, and I think Professor Coppa really hit on this, is that we certainly don't want to treat remix art as some sort of second class art form. It's not. It's actually a very important um, and old art form. And it's just one that's been marginalized until very recently. And on that point, I want to stress that this is what I have heard from, um, from folks, from remix artists. The exemption that the existing exemption sent a message to remix artists that their work actually is legitimate. And that was really important. It was very important to helping people sort of come in from out of the cold um, and fight back and, and you know, defend their fair uses and stand on, the, on their fair uses. Um, Clip licensing. Um, I think, I feel like this came up, we agreed on this in LA, but I just want to reinforce it. It just seems to me that clip licensing is simply not a viable alternative for remix artists um, because of cost. Um, many remixers are working on a limited or no budget whatsoever, so they just simply can't afford even minimal licensing fees. Logistics, not just the logistics of getting all the licenses that you might need in advance, but also even figuring out in advance what you need in, in our, um, reply comments, we point to the testimony of, of Elizabeth Kressinger, who's a remix artist. And she said, look, I need a whole alphabet in advance. I can't just pick a few letters in advance and decide what I'm going to need. It doesn't work that way. The creative process doesn't work that way. Um, and then frankly, for, uh, or for remixers as for documentarians and other filmmakers um, who are engaged in criticism and commentary, the licensing process simply isn't going to work. I don't think that the makers of The Twilight Show would have been thrilled to authorize Jonathan McIntosh to use all the clips that he used um, critiquing the stalking vampire Edward that we saw um, a couple weeks ago, uh, much less the kind of feminist critiques that we're talking about here today. Finally, um, I respectfully actually have to disagree a little bit with my witness, <laughs> Martine Reifey. Um, I actually don't think our exemption is all that broad at all. I would point you to the numerous limits that are built into the exemption. Um, and we heeded, in crafting it, many of the limits that were imposed by the or proposed by the register in 2010. So purely for profit, for profit uses need not apply. There is an objective limit. The artist must not just believe, but reasonably believe that circumvention is necessary. There's only one authorized purpose, which is the extraction of short clips. Right, which can have no conceivable impact on the market for the work. Um, with respect to 7C, you can only turn to digital distribution methods if, it's not, if the work you need is not available on DVD. Only non-infringing uses. So if you lose under 107, you lose under 1201. Important limit that's in all of these, but I think crucial to keep in mind. And finally, I just want to reiterate something that um, I mentioned in Los Angeles, which is that 
Um, we have no particular objection if we also want to build in some language saying for purposes of commentary and criticism. And that's because the works we're talking about are all for purposes of commentary and criticism. So there's no problem with that as far as we're concerned. So to close, um, these exemptions are just designed to bring the existing exemption up to date, to bring it consistent with um, technological and practical developments, and also to reflect the actual ethical practices of the communities that we're talking about. Thank you very much. Thank you. Who's your name? spend a moment on something that I alluded to this morning, and that is the loss in DVD revenue. Uh, again, as an overall matter, the uh, video entertainment market is in a decline. Um, the yellow line on this chart is the uh, DVD part of that, and as you can see, it has gone down um, dramatically uh, in the last uh, five or six years, and again, while we don't contribute this Know, as cause and effect to the to the exemptions that were granted first in 2006 and then in 2010, um, our view is that you need to take into account I think the marketplace in which uh, DVD exists as you um, look at uh, the range of uh, exemption requests that have been uh, submitted this time uh, and can take into account that it, it is not um, a market in, uh, in great shape at this point. Um, this is another depiction of much the same point, uh, showing uh, some projections uh, forward uh, that were done by Morgan Stanley uh, over the decline over the next, next uh, three years. Um, now, our overall point is that we believe that there has not been the requisite showing of adverse effect. And again, I want to go back to the point that points that I made at the at the outset this morning uh, in my testimony educators related panel and points that uh, Steve uh, Metallus has made a number of points during the course of the, of the day um, and that is that there needs to be a direct linkage uh, between um, the works distributed on CSS uh, of protected DVDs that are that are the, the requesters have been unable to make use of if they do not uh, enjoy the benefit of the, the exemption. Um, talk for a moment about takedown notices. I, I was, we were perplexed by what we heard about uh, the testimony in uh, LA, and I'm, I'm again perplexed uh, by the testimony here today. The takedown notice under Section 512, which was another part of the DMCA, does not include 1201 violations. And we, we did look on chilling effects, as, they, as we're displaying here, uh, for copies of and examples of take, takedown notices that have ceased to notices that had been filed uh, under this. We couldn't find any that had any reference whatsoever to circumvention or uh, uh, Section 1201. Um, so we think that is actually, as indicated, a red herring uh, in, in the proceeding and not something that uh, needs to be taken account of. Um, now, with regard to the alternatives uh, to circumvention, um, the we continue to believe that the video capture software, uh, certainly for um, uh, many uses, uh, the streaming websites, uh, we do think that, although, sorry that witness doesn't have a smartphone, there are many, many people who do have smartphones that is in, that is uh, ubiquitous and as was uh, indicated in, I think, one of Dean's uh, slides this morning, is 
between smartphones and tablets that are that are video recording capable, we're talking about hundreds of millions that are going to be in consumers' hands in the next uh, couple of years. Um, also, video video editing software, which can enhance uh, the recording um, recordings that are made uh, either by video capture or by smartphone, uh, would improve um, you know, where where there may be a quality issue. Um, I, I'd also note that I appreciate the, the, the witness's um, suggestion that 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 the uh, uh, technology that we've demonstrated is is probably good enough for biology classes. So. Um, we'll apply that to this morning's panel. Um, the also appreciate the fact that that unlike the panels this morning, um, the, the people on the other side of the room this afternoon or the late afternoon actually used the, the, the technology that we demonstrated. Um, and uh, um, so, for for their purpose. Now the question is whether in in, in many instances. Perhaps not all, but in many instances, that technology is good enough um, for as, a, as an alternative to circumvention. Um, one of the uh, things that we did hear about the demonstration that was made on May 11th was that it did not um, show action scenes and did not show special effects. Now that was because, again, we, we gave gave this to our, our teacher um, and said, okay, how would you use this in your classroom and, and pick the kinds of things that you would classroom and that demonstration reflected what his choices were um, you know for, for that particular uh, use now having heard um, criticism of that as I indicated we've done another uh, use of the video capture same video capture software um, which we can demonstrate Smalley said what? Smalley this is, said what? Sorry. Sorry. this is the, a scene from Battlestar Galactica which has a lot of action a lot of special effects and so side by side um, I'm doing this right, David. On the, on the left hand side is, is from the. Well, we'll first just see the video. Yeah, okay, we'll see the video. Yeah. Smalling said, we're on the computer, we can't For for um, you know it has it has a lot of action, a lot of special effects. Um, for many purposes, it looked, you know, to my eye, looked like something I'd be perfectly happy to watch on whatever for whatever purpose. Um, the um, um, to, to to see what it looks like, sort of side by side. Smalling said, "We're on the computer. We can't calculate that jump. Don't bother calculating. Do it." And what this is is showing the uh, video capture software with, to which um, we, we applied a, a again the inexpensive video editing uh, uh, program that, that we talked about earlier. Um, again, our view is that this is really quite good quality, and we made a little better with the video editing uh, software. Um, the uh, uh, again video editing. This, this slide um, shows that it doesn't really matter whether you're using a Mac or a PC. There are video editing, good video editing uh, software programs available. Um, this is from one of the, the video uh, sites themselves, where we're, we're point is that that the kind of software that we think uh, can enhance uh, you know, the video capture that I thought was pretty good to start out with. Um, is available uh, for use by the, uh, the bidders. Um, the um, so I, the, basically, our our view is that the denying the request uh, request for exemption uh, will not harm bidders. We also think that the the standards have been sort of turned around here. And I wanted to comment on that. That. What's happened, the, the, these are all de novo proceedings, and so the burden remains on the requesters to show 
that they would be harmed if there is no exemption and that the balance uh, favors uh, creating the exemption. It does not fall on us to say that for the past three years there was or wasn't harm uh, caused by the fact of the exemption previously. Um, we think there are an array of alternatives and that uh, uh, as we heard, uh, the video fitting uh, process is in fact a, something that people spend a lot of hours with and use a lot of time and effort and you're using video editing software as, as it is and uh, as, a, as a consequence using video editing software to enhance a little bit on uh, some of the alternatives is not a, a significant burden uh, in terms of the use of the, the alternative. Uh, I will say uh, if, if, you're, if you're going to the extreme of sort of blowing up the pictures uh, as we saw or uh, there may be certain circumstances where perhaps video capture software is not ideal. Um, I'm not going to uh, deny that. On the other hand, if you're using it, there are many purposes for which um, it, it would be uh, perfectly acceptable uh, as we as we demonstrated. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Steve Metallitz uh, here on behalf of seven national organizations uh, of copyright owners and creators. The chance to uh, comment on, uh, on these proposed exemptions, and I want to thank all the proponents who have done an excellent job of presenting the case for these exemptions. I also want to thank the uh, office for uh, structuring the, this hearing in a way that each of these exemptions uh, is looked at. Uh, separately, I, I have to uh, disagree with, I think it was Professor Wright who said the problem was this isn't linked up enough with the educational exemption, my, our concern, as we've expressed earlier, is it's probably the boundaries between these uh, exemptions or the links between them are totally unclear. It's just the, uh, that there's a lot of a uh, great deal of overlap, and we think these are all very different situations, the educational, the documentary and fictional <coughs> filmmaking, and, and the, the non-commercial video or, or fandom or, or, or getting. Uh, it, they differ in, in a lot of different ways. I think it makes sense. I'm, I, I think they should be, you know, different proponents should be talking to each other. I thought it was interesting that, that I, I thought Professor Turk was saying that it's easy to do screen capture, even though she thinks the results are terrible. And I, maybe she needs to give a tutorial to Mr. Bolos who thought it was very difficult to do screen capture, much easier to simply grip. But in any case, uh, I, I think these really are different uh, <coughs> cases. And they differ uh, both in terms of how viable the alternatives are and, perhaps more importantly, to what extent can the proponents bear the burden of showing that the uses that they wish to make of the material that they access through circumvention is, in fact, non infringing, which is the, the test that, uh, that the you know, statute, uh, as interpreted by the uh, office, sets up. And I mean, I, I, I hear the um, concern about a two-tier system and professionals being held to one standard and amateurs to another, I think that's a, a legitimate concern and one that, that should be addressed in the definitions. But the fact is that we really are talking about two very different types of animals here when we contrast the documentary films that were discussed in the last panel and the bits that are discussed here. I mean, just for one, uh, uh, just to highlight one difference uh, of the bits that, that I looked at in the test suite, uh, there is virtually no material that is original to the to the film to the maker of the bit. The authorship there consists, if there is authorship, it consists in selection, coordination, or arrangement of material that's appropriated from someone else. It's used. It's created by someone else and is used by the by, by the, the artist here. Uh, that doesn't mean it's not fair use, but it does mean that it's in a, I think in a somewhat different category than the documentaries that we were talking about in the last panel where the vast, you know, I think in most cases, a lot of the material that you would see on the screen is original to the documentary. Obviously, they may use a lot of clips from a lot of different sources, but I don't think there would be, there would be few, if any, that would approach 100%, uh, which I think is the case of most of the, of the bits that were, that were cited by the, uh, uh, by the proponents. Again, this is not in any way conclusive on fair use, but I think it stands to reason that it may affect the likelihood that the uses are, in fact, non-infringing. 
let me say two things about the existing exemption and then a couple of concerns about the proposed expansions uh, that are on the table now. First, I, I, Bruce already mentioned this issue, that we're, what we're sometimes calling the DMCA issue, which is kind of confusing. We're really talking about uh, the interplay between Section 1201 and Section 512 of the Copyright Act, both of which were part of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And, and I, I, I heard the previous witnesses saying that now with the, this exemption exists on 1201, uh, the, their clients are f feel free to fight a takedown. They can take a chance to defend their work as fair use. And to me, this is just a, a non sequitur. As, as uh, Bruce pointed out, um, you can't send somebody a takedown notice under Section 512 regarding an alleged violation of Section 1201. And it's only about infringement, only about uh, infringement of copy. And your counter notification isn't about 1201. It's only uh, to say that mistake or you believe your, your, your material has been misidentified, mistake or misidentification has occurred. Uh, so, uh, you know, counter notifications are very rare if you look in the overall scheme of, I don't know what the figures are now, when we looked at it several years ago, it was, you know, thousands of a percent perhaps of all notices uh, stimulated counter I suspect that's probably true before or after this exemption. I don't think there's any evidence that it's changed. And then once counter notifications are, are made, uh, the only option that the copyright owner has under Section 512, all they can do is if they, they don't like the counter notification, they, they can file a lawsuit and file it within a certain time limit or else the material is automatically reinstated by the, the service provider. Uh, I don't think we've had any, uh, I don't think that, that uh, I don't think there's any evidence that this exemption has affected that one way or another. Uh, it, it just it doesn't seem credible that uh, uh, copyright owners who think that the use is not a fair use would somehow, only if there's the add-on of Section 1201, would they then bring a claim against the, uh, what they view as an improper counter notification and claim that it was infringement and that it was not fair use. So I, 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 there's a lot of talk about what message the different uh, exemption send. Uh, this message is pretty garbled in my view. I don't think it has anything to do with the notice of takedown uh, process. The second point about the existing exemption is that, uh, that it talks about reasonable grounds for believing that circumvention is necessary. And I think the thrust of what Professor Tushnet talked about and others is that in the uh, the approaches taken by the beneficiaries of this exemption, that's that's just a totally irrelevant question. Uh, they're, they're, they're not, they don't know what circumvention is, they don't know what circumvention isn't, it, it's just not a factor in their determining how they're going to proceed. They're, they're after the best quality material, they're going to use a, 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 a circumvention tool if that gives them the best quality material. Uh, so it, it seems to me that this is a kind of a meaningless uh, limitation, it appears to be a limitation that actually has no practical effect. I think based on, on the, the the, uh, the worldview that I think has been well presented by the uh, uh, advocates for the, by, by the proponents here. So I, I think I would encourage uh, the office to take that into account. Let me just mention three concerns about the proposed uh, expanded exemption. First, the move to primarily, so this would uh, uh, cover primarily non-commercial videos rather than non-commercial videos, and that's clearly expressed in the EFF submission as meaning any video that does more than propose a commercial transaction. So we're, we're way, way beyond uh, the kinds of examples that are shown um, in, in the test suite, for example. Uh, we're, we're into infomercials, we're into uh, any, really anything that isn't, isn't simply a commercial. And uh, uh, to me, again, that, that, that means we're getting very close to saying for any type of use whatsoever. Um, the, the second point is that the, both, I think both of these uh, proposed exemptions, no longer, the existing exemptions speak in terms of motion pictures. Both of these exemptions speak in terms of audiovisual works. Uh, that's obviously a broader category, and we had uh, some testimony this morning about video games. It turned out that no circumvention was involved in that testimony, so I, again, I don't think we've seen any indication that anything other than motion pictures is really in play here, so I would very much question the expansion of this to uh, cover audiovisual works. 
And finally, with regard to, uh, I guess, 7C, uh, when the works in question are not readily available on DVD, then the circumvention would take the form of hacking online streaming services. I think this is uh, an exceptionally risky approach uh, for the office to endorse and talk about the message that would be sent, the, the message that would be sent to the producers of uh, much of this content. As you heard in Los Angeles, at Los Angeles, they are constantly seeking new channels and new methods for disseminating this material to as broadest audience as possible. A lot of that has to do with the, the online, but sometimes in these charts referred to as digital, but it's obviously a misnomer to the DVD and digital also. But the online uh, means of, of streaming as well as downloading, uh, this is a, a critical part of the future uh, uh, means by which the public will access uh, and, and to say that, that, uh, that if, even if it's a streaming only service, you could then hack that uh, uh, for a, in order to make a, any, just about any kind of video other than a, a commercial and even, uh, uh, you know, you can take your chances as far as the fair use is concerned. Uh, I think that sends very much the wrong message. We heard from the studios in Los Angeles that this is really a, essential for uh, the expansion of the online distribution means that they are increasingly using. So uh, I, I, I think the office needs to be extremely cautious about that and really, again, as to come back to where Bruce started, to, to insist that the proponents uh, bear their burden of showing that they, they can't make a, uh, uh, the non that the use that they want to make is, is in fact non-infringing and they just can't make it without being able to engage in that type of uh, circumvention. So I thank you for uh, for your patience. I know I've uh, uh, gone over some issues that were raised earlier in the day as well, but I, 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 I try to answer any questions. Okay, first, were you any people on the front? Yeah, or, okay, were you, there, there's some time. Well, why don't I just start by responding? But I think that's where you're going to that anyone else who has anything, again, when we're talking about response, directly in response to what was said. Don't, okay. This is not an excuse to start talking about something else. Okay, understood, thank you. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, let me start with um, the concerns about, I'll say market harm, which I realize is important a little bit from my understanding, but let's just talk about you know a potential harm that an exemption might cause. Um, first, with respect to, to DVDs, I think that Bruce concedes that there may be some losses in DVD revenues, but they can't attribute them to the exemptions, and I think they probably have a lot more to do with the rise of alternative services. Um, and also, you know, I can submit some supplemental materials, but the MPAA has been touting its record profits in movies for years now, so I'm a little surprised to hear that the, the sky might be falling, um, particularly with respect to, to um, and, the, and the notion that the bidding community might be contributing to that is, fundamentally wrong, because one thing we know for sure is bidders are fans. They will buy every version of Twilight or Buffy or <laughs> any, whatever, pick your, pick your show, pick your movie, that's available, extra features and so on. You know, these are people who buy DVDs, these aren't people who encourage others not to. Um, and with respect to, to the streaming services, you know, I realize that these are emerging services, although I would say they're pretty well entrenched at this point and growing rapidly. Um, and I don't want to repeat what I said in LA, but I, I would encourage the committee to sort of, you know, treat this a little bit like a court. Let's look at circumstantial evidence. 12 years ago, we had DVDs and CSS, and we heard that if there, an exemption were applied, DVDs would never take hold. And so we waited, DVDs flourished, even though for, there was also a record that the CSS had been long since hacked, right? And that didn't cause the end of, of DVDs and it didn't ruin um, the emergence of DVDs as a viable business model. All it did was make it harder for legitimate fair users to rip from DVDs. And I think it was really important that we finally came to the conclusion that that was not appropriate. I would encourage um, the Copyright Office not to wait another 10 years with respect to these new services where, again, we know that there are already tools available to, um, to rip from, from these services and manipulate the video from these services. Um, with respect to the, um, 
I, I think I need to clarify the 1201-512 content ID interplay. Um, there's no one who is claiming that you can send a takedown notice based on 1201. Right? That's not what the takedown notice does. What we are saying is that when people get a takedown based on their video, they, if they consult a lawyer, their lawyer is going to look at the video and say, slam dunk fair use, absolutely no problem, but how did you make it? And depending on the answer to that question, the lawyer has to say very different things to that person about what, whether they want to fight back or not and what the legal risks of fighting back or not are. That's what we're talking about here. We're not talking about 1201 takedowns. We're talking about you know, standard takedowns under 512 or effective takedowns under the content ID system. If something's posted on YouTube, things just get taken down and you have to decide whether you're going to dispute that. Again, if you talk to a lawyer, and it's probably the first time you are talking to a lawyer, or you're talking to the good people at OTW, they're going to have to have the same conversation. So that's what we're talking about. And I think that we've heard testimony from the witnesses who have explained that thanks to the exemption that was granted in 2010, they can now give really different advice. And that's a really wonderful thing. Um, so that is what we're talking about. Now, adverse effect. Um, I'm not quite sure how I'm supposed to show adverse effect fact with respect to the exemption that's already in place because the exemption's in place. So I think rather pointing out that we're able to do this positive thing and that that actually is occurring, which means that people are consulting and there, there's enough phenomenon happening, I think is, is a better way of showing that. Um, similar, but, but with respect to 7C, look, what we have is a situation where we have a lot of people who are incurring legal risk or likely to incur legal risk and they likely don't even know it. And if that's not an adverse effect, I don't know what is. Um, let's see, I, just want, I don't want to hit every single thing. Um, with respect to whether these videos are non-infringing or not. Um, so what we're hearing is that, well, remixing doesn't involve original material, so therefore maybe it's not fair use, which I think there's no court in the United States who's going to agree with that proposition. Um, and I would urge you once again, as I did in LA, Look at the videos that we've submitted in the record. Look at, which there are many. Look at the videos of the test suite. And I know that you guys did this last time, and I imagine it takes a lot of time, and I'm sorry for that. But if you look at them, you will see. These are all fair uses, and there are lots of them. Okay, so, and, and I think, again, it is telling that none of those examples have been picked apart by the opponents of this exemption. It seems to me that if they could do that, they certainly would. I would if I were them. Um, and they're not able to. And it's not just that they're not infringing. I want to point out, this is something that the register found last time, and I really want to stress it. They're not just not infringing, they're really socially beneficial. Okay, these are people who are participating and sparking further cultural conversation. That's important, that's valuable, that is core, that sort of reflects our core First Amendment values. Okay, we are supporting socially beneficial fair uses. And um, that, that strikes me as crucial. Um, last thing. Sure, there's more, but I'm sure you don't want to hear any more from me. Um, the question of whether the reasonable grounds for believing language has any meaning or not. Um, I think there's no question that remix artists want the best quality available. You ask them, would you like the best quality, the highest quality you can get? They will say, well, of course I would like the highest quality I can get. No, I don't want crappy video. I'm an artist. I'm trying to do good work. Um, but that's not the end of the story. They have to believe it, but they also have to have reasonable grounds to believe it. And that means if you ever go to a court, we ever fight about this, right? they're gonna have to show that they had a reasonable grounds for that belief. So it's not a silly limit, it's not an irrelevant limit. It's a limit that sets up, should a fight ever need to happen, um, a, a, an actual objective limit on the exemption. So I will, I will stop there and um, let the other folks talk about quality and other questions. <coughs> okay. Anyone else on the side have anything yeah. directly to respond? Just right. uh, four quick things. So I hear the opponent saying <coughs> that Bitter should be making different art without cropping and without effects because it does look really terrible uh, that way. Um, that's not really uh, what we as lawyers should be doing. It's not a rule of a fair use determination to say make different art. It's to look at the art we have. Um, the, 
Also, I think there's a little bit of a story not being straight on whether DVDs are in, in decline or going strong. And of course, more importantly, there's still no link between short clips made for remix purposes and full copies, which is an easily understandable dividing line that bidders have fully internalized. Um, third, your ability to speak shouldn't depend on your ability to navigate technical hurdles unrelated to the content of your expression, which is the, the extra hours I guess you're supposed to put in uh, fixing up the unfixable footage. Um, and it also shouldn't depend on your position as one of the one-third of Americans who can afford smartphones. And of course, uh, I should say, smartphone footage is no better for all these other things, right? They drop frames, right? Kids don't have a frame rate, so you can take smartphone video of your kids and it will look fine. But uh, if you take, you know, the frame rate will differ if you hold it up to a screen. So all the things we've been saying about screen capture are completely true of uh, uh, smartphone footage. Uh, finally, uh, just a point. Um, Mr. Turnbull's quote from the fan video site about your awesome options if you're Mac and PC, those options are Handbrake and Mac, Mac the Ripper. That is, that <coughs> video site is talking about <laughs> circumvention. Okay. I would just um, add a couple of things. Um, one, Mr. Mr. Metallic seemed um, unsure as to whether vids are authored, and all I can say is that um, the nature of remix video is exactly what he said. We don't shoot things ourselves. We take existing source and remix it, um, hence we. Uh, the second, I would simply echo what Professor Teshman said, the fact that phones are, smartphones are available does not mean that they are affordable or usable. Um, you know, I live in Minnesota, which is one of the big states in the middle, um, in a very rural area, um, and cell phone service is not always um, as reliable as one would like. The other thing um, about effects, I think again, if you look at the vids in the test suite, um, you will see that the, the kind of extreme cropping or zooming um, that one of my examples was intended to illustrate is in a lot of cases the norm. Um, not necessarily that effect in particular, although yes, zooming is done a lot, but other kinds of effects as well. So changing speed, right? Altering color. Imagine putting a filter, you know, or changing the color of a clip with that kind of blocky pixelation, right? So the image is already looking a little peculiar. If all the blocks of color change in sort of unpredictable ways when you change the color, um, you know, so if, if you imagine layering a color effect on top of a zoom effect, on top of a speed effect, on top of, you know, so effects are not a choose one and choose one only. They're often used in conjunction with each other. Um, and I confess that I did not take the time, because it is very time consuming, to show an example of a clip that has, you know, 10 or 12 different effects. But if you look at the test suite videos, you will see a number of vids that do have that kind of layering of effect, um, and if those are not immediately obvious, which I, I understand that they might not be to someone who is not familiar with the original source, but that is the kind of thing that we are happy to provide a sort of walkthrough of. If you want you know, a sort of rundown of here are the effects that are used at particular moments in the bid, we can contact the bidders and, um, and provide that sort of, here's what you're actually seeing when you see this bid, that you may not be aware of because the whole point is that they're seamless, right? Those effects can be made invisible if the quality of the source is good enough. You can think, well, didn't it just always look like that? No, it didn't always look like that, but because you know, someone was able to rip the source, you can produce extremely sophisticated combinations of effects. Okay, I have a couple of questions before I turn it over to Steve. <coughs> First of all, um, um, by Rebecca. Um, I'm not sure I've heard you too clearly, and maybe just the time of day and it's been a long day, but <coughs> uh, I did get a sense that you're, well, I'm not going to characterize my group. Let me, let me start by just asking a question. Have the two of you looked at at least some of the examples that the proponents have given of various vids that they say are fair use? Yes, I looked at some at, at most of the vids in the test suite. Okay, Bruce, that that means, no. Okay. Uh, well then, Bruce, you're, you're welcome to pitch in, and I, I encourage you to, because I want to hear your point of view. But with respect to you, Steve, I'm not sure I heard clearly from you whether you think most, some, or all of those do constitute fair use or do not. I, I didn't. I actually didn't look at them very much with that in mind. So I, 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 I want to look at look at it more thoroughly, to before 
didn't do any opinion. I, I'm happy to say that many of the bids that are talked about here probably are fair use. I won't talk about some of the specific ones. But, but this, this exemption is extremely broad, and it doesn't just cover the people who are active in the organization for, uh, for trans, uh, transformative works and, and who are benefiting from the advice and counsel that, that uh, Professor Tushnet and the others are giving. Um, and especially if it's expanded, as, as is proposed here, uh, I, I just don't think that you can make the, uh, indulge in the assumption that uh, th this use is in fact not infringing, which is the test. And I think uh, this is in, uh, uh, an area where it, there is a meaningful difference between uh, professionals and amateurs. It doesn't, to me, denigrate the amateurs at all to, uh, uh, to observe that they are probably less knowledgeable about the legal issues involved than are the professionals. So, if, they, if they're ignorant of it, then undoubtedly they're going to, they're, 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 they're not going to be uh, conforming their conduct to this, or they're less likely to be conforming their conduct to those standards. So it just seems to me that it, 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 you need to draw some distinction between the two groups and perhaps treat them differently, which is not the case under the existing exception. And the two groups are professionals and amateurs? Well, the documentarians uh, okay. and the fictional filmmakers that we talked about in the last panel, I think, are quite differently situated. Okay, so how do we, uh, <clears throat> let's assume we've concluded that an appreciable number of the bids that we've seen do constitute non infringing uses. And let's assume, and we'll get into this, I think, in the time left to us, let's assume that we've been persuaded that uh, there's no real way to get the quality you need to make the point you're making without circumventing. Um, they were put in a position where we seem to be en route to a, a, an exemption, although you may say there's still a lot of things we have to decide, but at least we seem to be on, on going in that direction. How do we cabinet to address your concerns while still permitting the non-infringing uses that these people want to be able to make uh, that take place? Are there <laughs> ways we can narrow this that, that sort of takes care of those, those who need to do it but doesn't allow the other kinds of uh, circumvention in other cases where it's not necessary? Uh, I don't think I have a very good answer for that. We didn't right three now. years ago, which yeah. is why we ended up where we were. Yeah, um, I, I because I, first of all, I guess I, I have to question the premise, but you know, we've already been through that as far as the, the, the extent to which these uses are in fact not infringing. Uh, in the previous panel, there was a lot of discussion about various factors that could be looked at to uh, to help increase the likelihood that the use would be in fact not infringing. And I don't think that the proponents have. I, I don't, I'm not sure there's much in the record that you could. Grab onto here to uh, uh, to, uh, to to narrow that. I, I don't know that that means that you throw up your hands and say, well, this, we'll just let every we'll just let anybody who's making a primarily non-commercial video uh, uh, take advantage of the of the exemption. <coughs> yeah. Um, one of the things, if I recall correctly, reading back through the history of these um, hearings, is that the focus is supposed to be on the class of work. That's one of the reasons why I admire the way that the EFF <coughs> has fashioned these two classes, because they aren't distinguishing between types of human beings. They aren't <coughs> distinguishing types of users, which isn't what the exemption is supposed to be. It's supposed to be focused on the class of work. So the limitations that are present should focus on the work. And that's, you know, that's why the, the exemption you have now, they're not parallel, because with the educational use, that is focused on the type of user, but the other two uses are as they are supposed to be, focused on the class of work. So in crafting the limitations, because I know, I remember from last time that the panel was asking how can we limit this, how can we limit this as much as possible. I would ask that everything possible is done not to, not to make categories of users, but to focus on the work itself that comes out of the end. Uh, we got two people on yeah, Bruce, you have the voting answer, you go first. I, I, if we're going to go back to that, then, then we'll go back to the 2003 to basis for the decision. And you folks might agree with her, by the and, way. And, and I, would, I would quite agree because I think that leads to no exemptions at all. Um, but yeah, I, mean, I think you've taken a fork in that road uh, right. uh, six years ago. And uh, uh, we think you took the wrong fork in the sense that we think Congress was concerned about the class of, uh, of, of works and did not want you to define this in terms of uses. <coughs> users and 
uses, but some water uh, over the dam uh, on that question. But if, even then, the, the, the focus was not on the work that was produced. But that's the focus was the, of the statute is on the work that is as to which access controls are being circumvented. And we now have an extremely broad category. We have motion pictures, any kind of motion picture, and we're it's proposed that we have audiovisual works, any kind of audiovisual work that's subject to it. So I think we have an extremely broad and not well-defined class of works. The only thing we have is some use and user type uh, limitations. So uh, my copyright professor hat impels me to say that, uh, as, you, as of course you know, the statute is not crystalline on audiovisual works versus motion pictures. I think that's a bit of a tempest in a teapot, and the uses we're talking about are going to be the same either way. So. Uh, I, getting hung up on that is probably not the most helpful. Um, the limitations that we propose are remix that is primarily non-commercial, that mm -hmm. is done as speech rather than profit seeking. And by the way, that in itself is a big thumb on the fair use scale. It's one of the big factors. Non-commercial uses are favored. They receive special presumptions, right, as per Sony. Um, and <coughs> that in and of itself is an inherent limitation. And of course, second, being non-infringing is part of the definition of the proposed class. Mm -hmm. So to the extent we're worried about that, uh, we believe we propose a definition that you know incorporates them. I, mean, I think we again. This is this is a field that's been well plowed in, in uh, LA and elsewhere. But just simply to define out the infringing uses and say everybody else is fine, uh, it, that isn't really a, a limitation uh, as far as we're concerned. It, it's simply to say because by definition it's only. Rebecca, you actually don't use the word remixes in yeah, your first class. Um, sorry, I was, was going to suggest that that, that, that might be that, helpful. That, <laughs> that, that, that is true. Uh, for, so um, I actually think uh, so. I think we can um, we can define it as a new work of authorship, for example, which has a background that's quite consistent. If we want a definition, right, it's quite consistent. You know, selection, coordination, and arrangement are classic forms of authorship. Again, there's plenty of law on that. Um, so if we're concerned about that, a new work of authorship seems to me a, a fine way, and that would also, uh, and we would then segregate out educational uses where you might want the standalone clip, and again, you know, that's standard face-to-face -face teaching. Um, so that, but I would perfectly support something, it's not a standard that was, you know, create a new work. Is that a step in the right direction, however small it might be, or yeah. does that not help you guys at all? Well, it doesn't actually, uh, you can create a new work that could be an infringing work. So it doesn't tell you whether it's... To create a new non infringing Yes. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, Corinne, did you have your hand up on... Uh, I, I did. I wanted to um, just um, call your attention to... I, I just came across this, otherwise I would have submitted it with, with our original um, um, proposition. But I noticed as I was looking around for definitions of, of non-commercial and thinking about this primarily non-commercial point, which I understand is troubling, um, and I looked at um, how Creative Commons defines non-commercial with respect to their non-commercial licensing. Um, and they struggle with this a bit too, as you can imagine, because um, people want to understand what they mean when they do a non-commercial license. And the way they define it, I think, is actually kind of useful, which are uses that are not primarily intended for or directed towards commercial advantage or private monetary compensation. And I think that's really what we're trying to get at here. When we propose that, what I'm thinking about is folks that I think arguably are engaging in non-commercial uses, but we want to remove any ambiguity. So someone like Jonathan McIntosh, who um, has a new project that he's launched a Kickstarter campaign for, to keep the lights on while he makes his video. Okay, he's a professional remix artist, this is what he does, but he's not in it for the money, and he makes his videos available completely non-commercially, not for profit. Um, that's the kind of use that we are trying to uh, create a space for. Yeah, but you know, PBS is non-commercial. Everybody accepts that, and they take they take donations. So is that really an is that really an issue? Well, actually, I think if you're making a, a remix video for PBS, it might. No, so, well, I guess my point being, if, if that's if that's the only reason, and maybe it isn't, that you have primarily non-commercial, mm -hmm. okay, except oh. the, the the situation right. where someone might take donations to fund it, yeah. then. Um, We've got plenty of real-world situations where actors, which everyone understands to be non-commercial, take donations to fund what they do. So do you really have a problem? Well, I think both with this and with the, the AV works, I, I fear that <laughs> we in, in, introduced this language in order to actually try to clarify the exemption and sort of bring it more in line with, with 
the, the statute and the case law, I fear that we might have muddied the waters a bit, <laughs> but it certainly was the intention. Um, I and mean, I do think that, but I don't know that a court would find that a video funded by a, a Kickstarter campaign was commercial. I think it probably wouldn't. But this way, remix artists don't have to worry about that. They can be comfortable that they aren't losing the exemption simply because of how they funded their work. So can I tell you, I'm sorry. So here's who we're concerned about. We're concerned about, say, somebody like Joe Sabia, who is commissioned to do this report for, you know, core political speech. Mm -hmm. But he got paid, right? So we want to make clear that the re since the result is this freely distributed you know, piece of cultural expression. Um, so, so maybe we want to focus on the output. Um, I, you know, I think we could easily do that. Um, we, we just want to make clear that he's with him. Why isn't what he did a documentary film? Um, so the so you, one could define a documentary as anything that has a video component that is integrated and that is factual and has a video component. But if you look at Primetime Terror, and if you look at um, so, uh, some of the other examples, like In the Cut that we talk about, which is this online journal where they show a clip and do a shot-by-shot -shot analysis in text, right? they're really multimedia works. Now, if you want to go ahead and craft the multimedia exemption that covers this, I would also say that would be awesome, too. Um, but uh, the, in some sense, we're sort of pushing the definitional questions around, and, and I agree they ought to be answered, and there are a variety of ways one could answer them. If you want an expansive definition of documentary, that could deal with it, absolutely. Um, uh, or, you know, pri uh, primarily non-commercial, and say what we mean is, you know, people who uh, produce stuff that is disseminated for free, um, even if they are ad-supported or commissioned. Even if they're ad-supported? So, well, so everything in the that's on broadcast television is non-commercial? Uh, so, so here's the thing. Um, you said this in the brief to the Supreme Court uh, in the video games case, and you're totally right. Uh, it, so uh, uh, that uh, movies are non-commercial speech; they're entirely protected by the First Amendment. Now, you, if you want, a, that's why we put in primarily non-commercial because. Um, we do want to, want to have some flexibility to recognize, right? There might be uh, places where, you know, at, at some point, a court's going to call it commercial. But we want to talk about those instances like In the Cut, right, which is, by the way, has advertising from Variety in the major Hollywood studios because that's where their audience is. Um, and Joe Sabia are covered by this because they're doing exactly the kind of work that we want people to do in terms of engaging in critical commentary. Um, uh, I think maybe the muddying of the water that has occurred here, I use Corinne's phrase, is commercial speech obviously has a, a definition in First Amendment terms, and then we also have uh, a body of law about commercial works, uh, in, in obviously relevant to, although not determinative of, determinative of uh, unfair use and so forth, but those, those standards are different. We would certainly agree that for purposes of First Amendment uh, <coughs> protections, uh, Hollywood films are not commercial speech, but uh, it, it's also clear that if you are using something in a Hollywood film, that uh, uh, you're, you're probably not going to do too well with the argument that it's a non-commercial use for First for, for fair use purposes. Okay, let's move on to another topic. Um, <coughs> yourselves in our shoes, and oh, well, don't do that, I wouldn't have that. <laughs> <laughs> We're confronted here with a couple of examples that seem to point us in two very different directions, and maybe you can help us out in figuring out how to reconcile them. Uh, we've got the example you folks show, showed on May 11th uh, of the uh, screen capture software and how it uh, replicated something in what you characterize as being very, very good quality, served just about anyone's purposes. We've got what you did this year today and showed, which, which every, I think everyone in the room could see the pixelation. Mm -hmm. So I guess for you, I'd say, do you accept that, at least in the case where Tisha was using the uh, software, that it didn't do the job, or is it just that she didn't know how to use it? Um, in your case, do you accept that in the one case where they actually showed an example on May 11th, was perfectly fine for any any conceivable purpose one would have in that particular case. Um, let's, let's start with that, just to get a baseline and see if people aren't going to agree on anything, or at least in some cases it works, in some cases it doesn't. Bruce, start with you. Yeah, I, I, I'd say that I, I, I wouldn't 
I wouldn't defend um, the, the, the image that was presented here as, as being you know, acceptable for, for the use that they were looking to put it. So, so for that, in that particular case, the, the screen capture software was not usable for the purpose. I, I do think that that doesn't mean it's not usable in a variety, I think it is usable in a variety of, of, of other instances, including the one we showed on May 11, including what we showed um, today, um, the example that we showed today. Um, but, but I'm not going to defend, defend the, uh, the image that we saw. Okay, so before we get to you folks then, what do we do with that? Uh, I mean, it, what, one might have walked out on May 11th and said, okay, problem solved, we don't need an exemption, screen, screen capture software does the job. I just heard an acknowledgement that it doesn't always do the job. So there are cases where it doesn't do the job. Do we just say, well, too bad about those cases, we're not going to have an exemption, or do we narrow the class to deal with that? How do we, what well, do we do? I, I, two things. One, one is that I, for me, on, on my previous statement, I wasn't going to defend the, the image that we saw. Whether the software was used to its greatest effect or not, I mean, we don't know. Um, I mean, there are ways to, to adjust it and, and that sort of thing, so I don't know. Um, I think at a, at a minimum, we would say that where it is usable, um, useful for the purpose, it ought to be used as opposed to certain. And if in a suite of, of alternatives, you, you sort of line up the various alternatives and you say, okay, um, among the alternatives, there should be something there that would be useful for the vast majority or a large majority of cases. The fact that a handful of cases, a small number of cases, might fall out would would not be the basis for an exemption. You realize if you throw that in, you're still ending up with what at the end of the day is a rather mushy standard. It's going to sort of be an eye of the beholder situation. Right? Well, no? they, 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 I said two things. It, it, and the, the, the second one, let me let me make sure you got the second one, which was okay. which was that if you look at at the range of alternatives that we put on the table, you know, here and, and other contexts, and say, well, okay, there are a number of alternatives for some reasonable percentage you know, of, of the cases of the use, those would be acceptable, then the fact that a handful of cases they might not be acceptable would not form the basis for an exemption. That's <coughs> Even if you get and say, well, there are enough cases that are outside that form the basis for, you know, we, we think necessarily there, there, there should be an exemption. Um, because of the cases that are that don't fit any of the alternatives, um, then I do. But I do think that while it's a mushy standard, I would encourage you to put in, um, you know, because I think something that says you need to, to look to the alternatives as your first resort and and circumvention only if it's necessary. Okay. So okay, we got at least two hands over here. So uh, three hands, four hands. Okay. Uh, Wants to talk first, talk first. I'll just say one <laughs> sentence. That sounds like um, we need to reasonably, right. reasonably believe that the circumvention is necessary. Right. That occurred to me. <laughs> well, okay, that's it. I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'll let Tisha talk because she's the expert. So um, I'm thinking out loud here and I will try not to ramble. Uh, I'm thinking about the two examples that we had before. So the Gattaca example from May 11th and, and the scene that I captured and ripped. I guess where, what I would say about the Gattaca example is that I would not capture it in the first place because it was an incredibly boring scene. And so as a remix artist, that is not the kind of thing I'm looking for. Now, I don't want to say that no one would. I mean, maybe there is someone who wants to make an incredibly visually boring thing. Um, that person is not me, and so perhaps I am not the best person to speak to that. Um, thinking about the Star Trek example, I guess part of my concern is that you can't know going in what the screen capture is going to do. You do know going in what DVD rip is going to do, which is that it is going to give you exactly what was on the DVD. You are going to have all the frames. You're going to have all the, all the visual information that you can possibly have. And also all the audio information, but I don't deal with the audio, so I, I cannot speak to that. Um, if I had taken that 10-minute scene, and I had wanted some clips from that to make a vid. I would have to capture the entire thing and then scrub through it 
and perhaps one of those two usable moments would be something that I wanted to use in a bid. And perhaps there were three other moments that turned out to be unusable. And so having captured that scene, I would then have to go back and rip that chapter of the DVD to get the stuff that I had decided could not reasonably be used for my purposes. And perhaps legally there's a super reason for doing that. I don't know. But practically, it seems, I'm looking for a synonym, a more diplomatic synonym for stupid, and I'm, I'm not finding one. Um, it just seems really counterintuitive to me that I would have to capture it, scrub through it frame by frame, and then rip it. I'm, I, I'm baffled, I have to say. So, uh, I just gotta say, again, an artist is being asked here to master a skill of orthogonal to our art, despite her testimony that it won't work for her, and we're told she must have been doing it wrong, despite the fact that she spent more time with video editing than the rest of us at these tables put together. And I, this fits into a message that unfortunately women and minority artists often get. Your concerns don't matter, your priorities don't count. And uh, I just think that's not, um, if, if we hold out for the hypothetical screen capture that you know works and we'll just hope it works on the next DVD, because we, it, it turns out, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, each one of those that doesn't get made because it doesn't work is a loss, right? Each black screen is a piece of speech that didn't happen because these are new works. And so it's not as if, you know, we make it up on the backswing or anything. You were starting I just wanted to point out that um, you know, to the extent to which we're focused on transformative works and we're looking at video as the building block for other works, we're looking at footage that, it, that the, the first capture or writ is really the starting point of an artistic process, right? And so that you need a higher quality to remember that you're going to be making something out of it. You're going to bend it and stretch it. Uh, and that that is um, you know, overwhelmingly consistent in the group of non-commercial videos that we're talking about, that these are things that you don't accidentally make a remix video. It's, a, it's an active artistic process of you doing something and making something out of a, a thing. Uh, and so consequently, the, the, the group uh, of videos that we're talking about are very likely that you need the high quality because you're about to kind of bang on them with tools in a way that may not be the case with other, uh, and you can speak more to this, but it is, it is part of what, it's a transformative work, I mean, where the, uh, you know, the OTW is for transformative works, I mean, the works that, that people have made things with. The other thing I would say is that that is only becoming more true. I mean, 10 years ago when I started vidding, there was a limit, there was more of a limit to the number of effects that you could practically put on a piece of footage because at some point your computer would start to choke, right? This was when we had, like a 20 gig hard drive was riches unimaginable. And, um, you know, a gig of RAM, you just, how, how could it be? It was the promised land, right? And so as computers have gotten more powerful, I mean, iMovie can do things now that my computer, you know, the, the, the programs that I was using when I first started could sort of barely handle. And so especially when you think about um, the younger users, people who are not using the kind of equipment that I'm using, um, you know, they're using whatever came standard with the laptop that their, that their parents got them for, you know, their 16th birthday or whatever. Um, they really want to use a lot of these effects. And more and more of those effects are coming standard on the sort of, um, entry-level software that comes packaged with new computers. And so we see more and more people who, it's just their default to make things glow, to adjust the color, to fool around with the contrast, to stylize the footage in various ways. I am kind of old school. I mean, I don't do nearly as much of that as some of the younger people for whom that is sort of the standard, to fool around with the footage in that way. Um, I mean, I do quite a bit of it, but I would certainly not describe myself as one of the most advanced users of those kinds of effects. And, and often those advanced users are, are some of our youngest users, interestingly. Most talented. Yeah, and, and most talented. I mean, I wish I could do that, but they're not going to grow up and be professors. Yeah. They're going to film school. I mean, they are. They, they, the young generation of women who can do these sorts of things uh, that you know, we, we're working to keep up, 
uh, they do go to film school. They've been through high school and then they go to film school or they go to arts programs, and it's, you know, which is wonderful. You know, uh, wonderful. We're only slightly jealous. Yeah, a little. Hey, Jim, can I offer two, just yeah. two comments on this? But first, I don't think this that what we're, we've been talking about is the same thing as having a reasonable belief that you have to circumvent. Because I, I, I mean, how would a court? Let's assume you never get to court. How, how would a court? Uh, resolve that they would say what is what would the reasonable bidder do and we're just hearing that every bidder would do the same thing they would rip so it, it just would never occur and what you're talking about is a little different would it's, be to say it, it's saying what you, you need try to get to first. Get there. yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you could all, you're only eligible i mean obviously it's a user defined and use defined aspect of this but it'd be, if you you have to try using capture first and see if it's if it's suitable for your needs so that might be one way to, to approach it the other point i just want to make is you know if you talk about what your authorship is, is taking all the most interesting parts of a motion picture and remixing um, We have case law on taking the most interesting parts of a motion picture. We have it in the, tra in the, in the trailer situation where presumably the idea is to get the parts that get people's attention the most. Uh, it's video pipeline case, and that wasn't fair use. I don't think that's how I, I, I'm not sure they <laughs> no. characterize what they do as, as, as taking the most interesting part. Well, I, I just heard Professor Kirk saying you, you, the most visually boring part, she would never use the shot that um, Tim Short used in his, in his classroom. He was, he was not trying to make a, a, a remix, he was trying to do something different. He would only use the most visually interesting parts. Again, I, I, I just don't think that this is conclusively fair use or even necessarily, in fact, non-infringing, which is your standard. And if you look at the, uh, the, the, the way this is played out in other contexts, when you take the, the most interesting parts and condense them, um, that's not, sometimes that's not fair use. Jessica, you were getting out of anything to say? I'm going to ask you anything. <laughs> well, I just want to point you to our discussion of Dian Duet Kisses, Der Commissar, which you know we've seen alternate readings of. Uh, and in our materials, right? The bidder provides an explanation for community understood what she was trying to do. Uh, the fact that, um, you know, not everybody gets all pieces of art, that's not what art is about. Um, but if people are perceiving separate messages, which is not the case in the video pipeline uh, case, uh, then that's transformative. And, you know, we invite you to look at their comments are in fact, even though we didn't submit it. Or it depends on what you pay, which we did submit. Uh, and see, you know, it's, it's not a trailer. Um, Rebecca, would you have any objection to reinserting um, the cultural criticism requirement? Uh, so, you know, I, uh, you know, this is what our community does. Uh, I don't think it makes, I, I think non-infringing, you know, is probably better since there's, you know, there's a body of case law about it, um, but I don't think it's inherently objectionable. Perfect. Some technical questions for you. Um, first, can you react to the notion that um, I'm trying to read my notes? Um, do you have any evidence of people actually leaving low quality videos and hitting the back button? That was something. Um, mentioned, but is there any evidence of people actually turning away from material that is produced in a, in a way that produces lower quality, that is using lower quality original material? Sure. I mean, so I, I will say that my examples are several years old, so they are not perhaps the most recent examples. I've been busy doing things like getting tenure, so I have not been spending as much time with the community as I would like. But um, on a couple of um, bitter discussion lists or bidding discussion lists um, and, and live journal communities, there have been examples of someone um, recommending a particular vid and other people saying, I found that unwatchable, right? You know, I, I, I clicked through to it and it just looked terrible and I looked away. So I don't think that um, every single person, I mean, I think people have different standards, right? And I think it's possible that a particular person might find a vid interesting enough that they would watch it despite low quality. I would never want to say that no one would ever look at something pixelated. I, I don't know that. I can't control that. Um, but there are instances, yes, where people 
um, just look at the quality of something and say, uh, you know, one of the things that you have to remember is that there are thousands and thousands and thousands of bits. If you have a favorite character or a favorite TV show, I guarantee you there are bids for it. And so if someone sees a low quality bid, why should they lose that three minutes of their life when they can go find a shiny one somewhere? I understand. I was just I'm very specific yeah. I think you answered that. Your comments seem to be the closest thing you'd have to evidence of people actually turning away. Is that, is right. That I mean, can so I mention actually, we also in our submission, we actually do have some quotes about that. Uh, the com similar type uh, of yes. comments, not statistic of some sort of uh, view of people turning away from No, patients. so most, most research in the community is, is qualitative um, <coughs> for a variety of reasons, including the difficulty of doing, you know, what is basically internet-based research. So essentially any, any research is going to be qualitative, I mean, other than Michael Wesch's, who just has raw numbers. Can, can I add also that there's a practice in the community of video remastering, where fans will go and, for instance, as I said, there were vids made with VHS footage, which looks really terrible now. But people love these vids so much, but find them so unwatchable that later fans will take later DVDs and remaster matching shot for shot so that the vid now becomes watchable to a community that can't tolerate the older, uglier footage. Um, and so sometimes it's the vidder themselves who will remaster right, their own work. It's I did a great vid, and I'm going to redo here the 2010 with the shinier, clean footage. Or sometimes fans will remaster another fan's work as a tribute because they love this piece of work so much and they want it to look good. Is that fair use of the word? It's, it's often referred in our, it's, it's taken in our, in our community as a gift and as a critical, as a celebration of the thing, um, right? And use, you know. But, but yeah, I mean, I think that shows you that people are willing to actually put in work. It's seen as a labor. I mean, it, you, you don't claim it as your own. You say this is so-and-so's vid uh, done with clean, beautiful footage. Um, back to Ms. Turk. Um, talked about moving to lossy format as a last step. Is that possible in what you're doing in, in making a vid? Can you just put that only moving to the lossy um, format as the last step so you don't lose any of the immediate steps? Um, well, yeah, I mean, that's the ideal, okay. right? So if I rip a DVD and I, in, and so I load, I do the necessary pre-processing and I load that into, which does involve some loss of quality. I mean, like, you know, the, the stretching or, or shrink, um, squishing, something that was encoded anamorphically involves losing some data, but that's a necessary trade-off, right? I can either lose a little bit of visual data and have people that don't look like people, <laughs> um, you know, or, um, or have people that look right or the other way around. I'm sorry, I'm, it's the end of the day, I apologize. I think you know, so, um, Then I do all the editing um, which the, the point of that kind of nonlinear editing is that it doesn't change the original files, right? So I have the original clips from the DVD that are on my hard drive, um, and whatever I do to them in Premiere does not change those original files. Um, I'm manipulating sort of um, phantom versions of them. So what I'm getting is if the intermediate steps using that um, presumably ripped original material don't degrade that. Is this, can the same be said for if you acquired the original material through screen capture or smartphone capture? At that point, are those, is the editing also lost? Why, what's the difference? Why would one, um, why would steps in editing the um, rip material not lose data, but editing with the um, captured material right, lose right. data? It, it loses quality on export. So as soon as I have taken, but only the only the um, screen capture. Oh. No, they both do. Yeah. But if you uh, remember the okay, so the example that I showed where I had um, taken the um, pixelated captured version and the not pixelated ripped version, the difference between then when I zoomed in, cropped and zoomed in, the difference between the capped and the ripped footage when you when you do the crop and the zoom. The difference between the frames was much more exaggerated for the captured footage than for the ripped footage. Because if you're starting from lower quality, then the hill that you're rolling down is much steeper. Does that make sense? 
it makes sense, and I thought I was hearing that each step involved necessarily had degradation. Just each step, no matter what you were doing with the um, editing, I'm, I'm I'm not clear if that's only the case for one format. I understand when you're actually the the, the capture of um, a larger screen, and then you're only seeking one the upper right hand corner, and you're backing out. But yes, we saw it on the screen more pixelated. It was whether each any kind of editing step also degrades the um, the shot, taking away the notion of just taking a portion of the screen. Right. What an effect does is it manipulates a particular, um, it manipulates every pixel in the frame, right? It makes it lighter or it makes it darker or it changes its color or whatever. And when your clip has a lot of visual information to begin with, then each of those pixels gets manipulated individually and the result is pretty seamless. When you're starting with source that has quality problems, you can't do that as well because you're missing frames, because pixels have gone from being individual pixels to being blocks. And so weird things can happen. I mean, you start to get really unpredictable results when you do things like try to blur something or change the color of something or um, do any of the other effects that you might do, um, you know, change the speed or whatever. So what you get then when you do the, the final export may look quite dramatically different. And here again, I have to admit that I did not actually try to vid with the screen capped footage. I mean, I sort of recoiled from it as from a poisonous snake and did not want to even go there. Um, but you just get potentially really different results I mean, because again you, you've lost visual, you, you've lost information right in the form of those pixels that you cannot get back. One of the examples in the, in the tech day, the um, social studies teacher, I believe, when he, he screen captured originally, he only wanted the upper right hand screen, so for example, and that's what he screen captured. So therefore, there wasn't the need to just then take that portion. So you were getting that as original source, or screen capturing the original source of just what you were needing. I think the same might be able to be done with regard to speed manipulation, where you're, you're manipulating the speed at the outset of the playing of the original source material. And I realize, as you just said, you probably didn't, you recoiled from the um, screen capture, but I have to ask, do you have any reaction as to whether that's possible and would be sufficient? Um, so the thing about capturing just a piece of the frame is that then if I'm going to use that in the context of a larger video, either I have to resize it, I have to blow it up, or else I have you know, lots of shots that are filling the entire frame and then suddenly I have a little piece up here. So sure, you can capture just this piece, you know, your frame is like this and you capture just this piece, but then to make it this size again, you have to resize it. And that's exact. And you saw what happened with my example when I cropped something and then resized it. I saw it with your example, I agree, and I understand. I'm just look, we're getting to alternatives. We're talking about alternatives. Yeah, yeah. And, and using this, uh, using screen capture, trying to take into account, talked about advances of, you know, 10 years ago of computing power. I think we're trying to take into account the potential for advances in other technology that might um, limit the areas in which an exemption is necessary. But uh, resizing the, the capture window doesn't change the number of pixels it takes right. in. So you can never, you could make it smaller, but you can never make it better. No, but 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 I think I think the point was that that if you if you originally take only the upper corner of the picture, you you will be getting a higher percentage of the pixels from that upper corner of the picture than if you take the entire. Um, screen. I mean, that's that's the point. So you you would be starting with a better original. Right? The problem is that that's not actually true. I mean, the number of pixels is the number of pixels. You can't just sort of say, "I wish this were." I mean, if I could no. say, "I wish there were more pixels," believe me, I would. But that's no, just. No, I mean, but, if, but your you, but but your point was that the screen capture. I'm I'm, I'm not. I, I, I can't believe it. I'm not an expert on this, but I'm trying to replay in my mind logically what you've said. 
and and my point is that if you're if you are capturing an entire image, it has however many pixels, yes. you know, and you're going to lose some percentage of those. So you're 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 losing some of those. But if you're taking a or you're 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 only going to capture a certain number of them. If you're taking only a, a smaller portion, then it seems to me you're going to get a better image of that smaller portion than you would of the whole. Um, no, you're not, one. because it is it is the number of pixels that it is. I mean, so if if the original frame, as it would be on a ripped DVD, is 720 by 480, that is 720 by 480 is the number of pixels. If you capture over here, you're going to get something like, say, 350 right. by 200. And so you can either make a video that is 350 by 200 pixels, or you can resize it to be 720 by 480. And so you have stretched the pixels out. So something that was one pixel is now going to be a block of, say, 9 or 16 or some other you know, square of um, of pixels. And that's what pixelation is. <laughs> but the speed issue is you're often speeding up clips in order to make them in sync with other clips. So you wouldn't necessarily know at what speed you would need to speed. I mean, hypothetically, just kind of following your example, you see what I'm saying? If you played the original faster, you often don't know what you're matching to because the idea of the remix is it's, it's like trying to get one piece of the cake without the rest of the cake. It's back you know to the, I mean? you need all the letters. You need the letters you first to just I, decide. You don't know what will, speed that, you, you might be trying to match five movies, and you want a character, a big called One Girl Revolution, and there's a sh five shots in a row where a woman is running left to right across the screen, and actually it's five different women, but they're matched up so that you have an effect of one woman running across the screen. How would you know how woman number three, how fast does a woman number three need to Go. I mean, if you see what I'm saying, so what the video, edit video editor is going to do is have the five women run in such a way as the, the effect is one woman running across the screen, but you couldn't do that in advance. Like, no, like, nobody would do that. Because here, here is the other thing that I would say, um, because I, I appreciate the, the sort of attempt to look ahead and anticipate, you know, what uncharted wonders are we going to be dealing with. Um, we had three years ago demonstrations of screen capture technology. I would say that um, the improvements in screen capture technology have rather decidedly not kept pace with other kinds of improvements. So um, screen capture was bad three years ago. It may be marginally less bad now. But I guess I personally do, haven't seen, and I will freely admit I'm not an extra expert on screen capture software. Um, I have not seen enough of an upswing to suggest that we are headed towards some magical promised land wherein screen capture is, is fabulous for things other than what it is designed for. Screen capture software is great for what it's designed to do, but capturing video is not what it is meant for. I think it's a little bit unfair to ask that of it, to be honest. Thank you. I have one more question for Corinne, and that is, um, tell me, why shouldn't any limitation, any exemption for um, online distribution why shouldn't those be limited to specifically cited to TPMs? I'm sorry. Why should any exemption for online distributed content be limited to the um, exemption of prevent of circumvention and anti circumvention methods that are cited to in the record? There are only a handful that are specifically cited, yet the, the requested exemption is for is broadly um, stated. Yeah, fair question. Um, we pointed to the examples that we could gather based on our research. Um, a lot of the access controls are proprietary. We don't know the details of, of how they work. Um, so we provided the example that were readily available to us. And I think if, you know we're looking at something that's going forward for the next three years. The technology is going to change. It may change quite rapidly. So if we want an, ex an exemption that actually really does protect non-infringing uses, we need one that's flexible enough to take advantage of those examples in technology. I guess I should, shouldn't just be directed to them. Does anyone else have anything to add about why, that, why we shouldn't limit it to just the um, so TPMs that are mentioned in the record? So I think it's, it's the same thing. We actually don't know. Like, we have some guesses. There are, there's some public reporting about what Unbox uses, right? But a lot of that is trade secret. So uh, it, uh, if, if you're asking us to identify what the DRM is, we don't 
we don't know, you know, that, uh, and and probably couldn't find out um, without extensive discovery, which you know I don't think anyone wants us to think. Oh yeah, actually, if they want to share. <laughs> Amplify the right. <laughs> no, but I realize I realize it's separate. The other thing I, I would just reiterate um, that that was brought up last time, and it's certainly true in LA, is that um, with respect to cell phone unlocking, I mean, there's different modes of unlocking your cell phone, and that wasn't considered a, a really serious problem. And I think that here it's the same kind of thing. You, you need to give people the flexibility so that this exemption is actually stable for three years and works for three years until we can all come back again. I think if I just I mean, I think the, the consequence of that is that you would be saying to content owners, no matter what technological protection measure you use is, you know, in order to distribute your material online, it can be hacked under, under this exemption. It really doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter whether you use a different one or the same ones that you're using now. Um, again, I think you might have a words, like screen capture. Sorry, like screen capture. No matter what you use, you can, uh, everyone has apparently conceded now, except uh, <laughs> not entirely you, it's true. Uh, uh, but you conceded that some things are legal. So well, but, we have to but we've explained uh, what the particular, what the criteria are that make it legal, so. Although just, to clarify that, n neither of these exemptions uh, address Blu-ray or AACS, right? So there's no That is true. We, uh, this does not ask for uh, Blu-ray. Okay. <coughs> more question. Um, in a sense, it's reverse of a more question I asked Steve earlier on. Um, I haven't read every fair use case, but I probably read most of them. Um, I can't think of a single one in which a court has actually held that someone who simply took a bunch of pre-existing material and rearranged it was engaging in a fair use. Are we on totally unplowed turf here, or are there case, is there case law on that? Part? So, well, the most obvious to mind, of course, is, are the Google cases. So they are, not, uh, they are not the same because what's created there is actually a new reference work. Um, and of course, there's underlying code that is created, much like there's an underlying structure and it's selection, coordination, and arrangement. Uh, so, but part of this is, you know, this is a form of art that felt like it had to be underground for a long time. And you did have uh, you did have some examples. There's actually a somewhat famous for the art world uh, thing about Wonder Woman from the 70s, where an artist actually did this with, with Wonder Woman, uh, clips from Wonder Woman. Um, but part of this is, uh, you know, we've seen courts find transformation where artists like you know, Jeff Koons are engaging in you know, transformative <coughs> recontextualizations. We've seen, you know, the large-scale database uses, which again, you know, are repurposing works. Uh, and you know, we're we're actually ready to do this. The problem is that without an exemption, you know, we are we have to tell a client. No, you know, there's a, or here's the risk. The risk is um, if you counter notify, um, there's a slam dunk 1201 case against you. Why would a copyright owner ever litigate the fair use under those circumstances? So that, that's actually, you know, if, if we want the evolution of fair use to continue, especially in non commercial uses where, you know, there's a, there's a lot of value there, um, we need an exemption. Steve, you want the evolution of fair use to continue, right? Absolutely. <laughs> the, the herring has gotten redder and redder. <laughs> I think the advice, I mean, I, I, I've, I've advised clients in this situation. I mean, so I'm, so if, if I'm confident it's a fair use, and then, and then you get to the question of how did you make the, the work, I, I, you would tell someone no one has ever been sued for a violation of 1201A1, certainly not without a claim of fair use, uh, uh, of infringement. So if the copyright owner think is not persuaded by your counter notification and decides they want to pursue it, yeah, they may well throw in a 1201A1 claim as well. By that logic, but, we shouldn't issue any exemptions then. Well, <laughs> but, but the idea that, that somehow this has changed the dynamic of, of, uh, uh, 
uh, of the, the notice of takedown process, it really, I think this has crossed the line from a nice to agenda, to be perfectly blunt about it. And I, I think uh, you're, the copyright owners have very little incentive to bring a standalone 1201A1 case in, when they don't think there's a, an infringement matter, and that's why there haven't been any. So, okay, so you described the complaint, and I actually agree. The problem is the summary judgment motion, right? So, let's have summary judgment on whether this is a fair use and a 1201 violation. Well, the, the, the 1201 on the, the 1201 violation, summary judgment for the plaintiff, right? You're not, uh, because without an exemption, you violated the law. So, uh, it is absolutely true, I agree, that it is unlikely for the average copyright owner to bring a standalone claim. The problem is, they don't have to. Just two things. One is, I, I would also submit that, that um, Steve's clients are, are probably not the same kind of people as the remix artists that we're talking to, and, by which I mean that they are not in the same position to take on legal, legal risk, I suspect. Um, as, as the remix artists that we're talking about. And, and secondly, I, I, I want to circle back, back to the point of has there been a fair use case that's specifically on point? And if there's not, where does that leave us? And I think we had this fight last time and I think it came out the right way, which is that can't be the rule. Right? Because then, well, for one thing, fair use case law doesn't evolve, but also it, it sort of suggests that you guys aren't able to make fair use evaluations, which of course you're perfectly capable and <laughs> more capable than many. Um, of making fair use evaluations and making evaluations as, what, as to whether a group of works and uses are likely to be fair uses. You don't need to wait for the Supreme Court to tell you that this use is specifically a fair use. Well, this is probably not an issue you want to uh, inaugurate at 5.45 p.m., but I think you know our view is that you should be guided by uh, <laughs> what the case law is, and, and you should be extremely cautious about issuing uh, pronouncements about fair use ex cathedra. Um, and I, I think you, you asked a very good question, and it, it just, I mean, I, as I said uh, an hour or so ago, the fact that these works do not contain one iota of, it, of original material, they do contain, or they may contain, selection, coordination, and arrangement of other people's material, of material created by other people. But they, I, I think that is a factor to take into account. It distinguishes them from the previous panel. And it doesn't mean that they're never fair use. I would never say that. Uh, but I think it's a factor that you should take into account in applying the standard that Congress wants you to apply, which is, are these uses in fact kind? I'm sorry, I can't, I can't really resist. I'm not a lawyer here, so a lot of this is over my head. But if you've been in an art gallery in the last century, collage, appropriation, particularly in kind of feminist art and the history of that, you know, whether it's Duchamp stand alone or putting a mustache on the Mona Lisa, I, I, I as, a, as, a, as an art professor, I find the conversation a little baffling. Um, the idea that, that the standard is a sort of requirement of originality when I can cite reams and reams of kind of feminist art criticism that talks about appropriation collage as legitimate artistic techniques, which is not to say that every single copied thing is fair, um, but there's a big scholarly history on, in my side of the field that, so this, I don't understand this conversation. Again, I think that's will only depress you. <laughs> I would also never say that these these works have no artistic merit. I'm not I'm not the one to to, to gauge that. I, I'm really looking at a, a body of law which does depend on originality. Uh, originality is the touchstone of copyright protection. So I just think I think it's a factor that. And again, I'm not saying that all of these work uh, all of these uses are unfair, but I think it's a factor that. You and again, you know, we have this whole category, selection, coordination, and arrangement, where uh, we, I mean, you guys issue registrations every day, right? Uh, We're trying to cut back on that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I've heard. Keep, keep your eyes open. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's original, and, uh, you know, there are a variety of editors, there are, uh, not, uh, there are a variety of artists, uh, um, producers, who would actually be surprised to hear. Um, that selection, coordination, and arrangement are not original. Um, I believe, you know, Congress would be surprised to hear that it's not this explicitly in the act. And the question then is, what is the, is the original selection, coordination, and arrangement? And we've given you many examples of selection, coordination, and arrangement that combine to have a powerful communicative effect that is distinct from the original, which is why it was made in the first place. <coughs> 
Okay, very good. I think we can call it a day. Everyone will agree with that, if nothing else, yes. <laughs> today. And uh, we will see some, maybe many of you tomorrow across the street. Nine o'clock. Uh, Eight o'clock, huh? Nine o'clock. 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 Nine o'clock.